I greet all of you. Uh, it's three o'clock uh, Lagos time, which is uh, 1400 GMT. Uh, and uh, I would like to call the meeting to order. My name is Kwesi, uh, Kwesi Atakra. I am um, working with IITA. And uh, for this event, I am your moderator uh, for the event. So on that basis, I really will thank all of you and uh, to welcome you to the event. You would be hearing later on from a representative of the Director General of IITA who will be giving the formal welcome and also share some opening. So I trust you are all comfortably seated. And uh, let me begin You are frozen, Chrissy. Um, Ken, uh, off, Afen. Um, Chris is frozen. Can somebody help him? I'm on that, Martin. Just give me a second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, we ran into a little bit of technical problem with our moderator, with Dr. Atakara, but he's working on that now. Uh, my name is Ken Dashiel, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the representative of um, the IITA Director General, uh, Dr. Sanginga, and the, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alfred Dixon. He's the Director of Development and Delivery here at IITA. Alfred? Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Director General of IIT to be invited to give a remark at today's event, a third side event of the Science Days of the United Nations Food System Summit 2021. I commend the organizers for putting up this meeting for us to reflect on our food systems, especially as it relates to Africa. Indeed, it is becoming clear to all of us that Africa's food systems are on a shaky foundation that requires urgent attention to salvage. The impact of the coronavirus in recent times demonstrated the need for Africa to fortify its food systems. This meeting must come with urgent and pragmatic steps to salvage the food systems and put Africa on the path of self-sustenance and prosperity. For too long, Africa has suffered from the vagaries of climate change, pest and diseases, and ineffective food and market systems. The bottlenecks are numerous. On the flip side, there are innovations on the continent to contain these challenges. This is the time to harness and tap those innovations for Africa's shared prosperity. Examples abound, and indeed, if we harness the power of science and technology, we could reverse the trend that has been characterized by several missed opportunities. 
Permit me, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to mention that the Technologies of African Agricultural Transformation TAT is a classic example of the tra trajectory that Africa needs to take to address its food start challenge. In a very short period, tax interventions in several African countries are lifting millions out of poverty, creating jobs and wealth, and more importantly, addressing the question of hunger and malnutrition that is still an albatross on the continent. As we deliberate on this subject, ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to identify partnership models that are effective for the modernization of Africa's food systems. Two, reflect on the timeliness of the United Nations Food System Summit initiative for our world today. Three, ex examine the relevance of the food systems theme for the African continent and for the reform of the CGR into one CGR and how it includes strong focus on food systems and agricultural transformation. I thank you all. Dr. Over Dixon, yeah, uh, Chief Dixon, thank you very much for those very encouraging words. Uh, Zoom coordinator, I do see that Dr. Takra is uh, there. If you can uh, unmute him. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kenton, for stepping in. That's a sign of resilience, that when something crashes, somebody can stand in and the meeting goes ahead. So thank you very much. And uh, thank to Alfred, who has also given us the welcome on, the, on behalf of the Director General. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you to do one thing for me. Um, we want you to do get into the chat box and do some self-registration, uh, self-introduction. All we want you to do is to put your name, your institution, your position, and finally, in bracket, you put whether you are male or female or whatever you are. Uh, please, that's important because we need to show the gender uh, participation in this event. So get into the chat box and you put your name, your institution, and then your position. And uh, also in bracket, you highlight for us. That would be very much appreciated. For this session, what we're gonna do, there are two key parts of it. We're gonna have some keynote presentations and there will be two people that I will introduce shortly who will be giving us the keynote presentations. But after the keynote presentations, we would have a panel session and we have three very enlightened individuals who are going to be on this panel session and uh, share ideas and uh, share results that they have obtained in relation to this theme area that we are addressing uh, today. Um, the, a very important part of this process is going to be the engagement of all of you in terms of the participants. And so the participant engagement is a very, very vital part of this. And we're gonna use a number of mechanisms for that. The first mechanism I want to emphasize is the chat box. You have already got in there to introduce yourselves. I want you to be alert to the use of the chat box. Whilst presentations are going on, if any thought comes into your mind or any point, or you wish to make a question, don't even wait for the presentation to finish. Please go into the chat box. We would like to see engagement. We have two people uh, who are chat box managers and they'll be looking through the questions you post part of the discussion issues that we will be having. We will also run a poll, a poll which will basically give you a very uh, straightforward question on which you will pick multi-choice type of uh, event. And then finally, we would have 
uh, request for you to make use of a Mentimeter. And Mentimeter is a very simple process. We will have, I think, two questions that you will have to address through the Mentimeter page. But let me uh, alert you about how to go about it. There will be a link and you have to click into the link to be able to have the Mentimeter page open. And that link, I believe, is already posted in your chat box. So if you get into your chat box, there must be a message there which shows you the link for the Mentimeter. So when it's time, uh, you will get questions that come on that link and uh, which you would uh, respond to. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to get into our very first poll. We're going to run the first poll. Uh, and it's a very simple question. I'll ask the Zoom manager to post the question uh, on the screen and uh, request all of you to address that question. So the question says this, for accelerated agricultural transformation to be achieved for Africa, there must be A, B, C, D. So it means you are picking the item that you feel is most critical. Um, and in the last column, you see it says other. Other basically means you think there is something more critical than any of these four items. So you can click other. But when you click other, we encourage you to go into the chat box and tell us what that other is. We really would appreciate that. So please, we have one minute for this exercise. And I can see people are already clicking to basically indicate what they see as a critical bottleneck. Your first bullet is about coordination, linking research and delivery. Your second is on seed and seed systems delivery, etc. Your third is on mechanization. People are saying, hey, we cannot go on with the whole. So mechanization is the answer. Uh, the fourth is about enabling environment, including private sector engagement. And then the fifth is other. So if you can, for the next 30, 30 seconds, you complete that and that study would be done. Okay, so we can all see the results on the screen. And this is a very telling result. It tells us that the issue of coordination, the overall linkage between the research that has been going on and the delivery and the development arms of operation is a critical factor. So this is something that I want all of us to keep in mind as we go through the rest of the, of the session. Uh, of course, the other elements are all important. Seed, mechanization, engagement with private sector, all that is important. Um, but if you don't have the coordination and the link in item one, then you are not going to make it. That's very interesting. I am asking, uh, Sabra, that when it is time for her to comment on the chat box, she can tell us if there is some uh, input that has been put there in relation to the other uh, item. So thank you all very much. Um, we can close the poll and move on to the keynote presentations which is a very important part of our business here uh, today. The first keynote presenter that I'll present is Dr. Martin Fregene. Dr. Fregene 
is Director of Agriculture and Agro-Industry at the African Development Bank. He is a plant geneticist and molecular breeder with 25 years of experience in genetics and breeding of cassava. Dr. Fregene developed the first molecular genetic map of cassava and started the first cassava molecular breeding program to accelerate development of improved cassava varieties for various agroecologies of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. He began his career at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture as a cassava breeder. While at IIT, he was a recipient of a Rockefeller Foundation postdoctoral fellowship on genetic mapping that took him to the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, SEAT, in Cali, Colombia. After SEAT, he joined the BioCassava Plus project at the Danforth Center, a multinational development program funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he rose to become director of the program. So you would not be wrong if you see Martin as Mr. Cassava Improvement. But I can assure you, he is definitely more than cassava, as can be seen from his current position as Director of Agriculture and Agro-Industry with the African Development Bank. By the way, let me emphasize that the Africa Development Bank is a principal funder for the TAT program. And the bank is also supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who are funding, especially the clearinghouse function of this program. So one thing is a great delight to invite you to share your thoughts uh, with us. Thank you very much, um, Chrissy. And um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to congratulate ITA for the initiative of hosting this uh, meeting. I think um, this meeting, as you will all see, is a very important contribution to the UN Food Security um, Summit. Sorry, UN um, Food Systems Summit. Yeah, and I want to begin by saying that um, this topic of modernizing African food systems and also partnerships to achieve it is coming at no better time. I can, you know, I can tell you that um, COVID-19 has really convulsed Africa's food systems from production where restrictions and movement have led to farmers being unable to get to their fields or inputs being unable to get to the, to the, to the farm, to aggregation, to processing, where lots of um, perishable foods like vegetables and fruits have been lost in the farms, all the way to distribution and marketing. It is it's estimated that um, Africa has probably lost the neighborhood of um, 10 to $15 billion just from the lockdown. And the agricultural system has actually shown it prone to shocks, shocks like a pandemic. So this is coming at a very important time. And I, I just want to share some of my thoughts. I have to say that this is not an exhaustive um, academic presentation that I'm going to share with you. I'm, I'm going to share with you work that has been done in partnership with um, city centers at the bank and also work that has been done in partnership with the private sector and many other people. Just to show that we do have a, a clear understanding of what needs to be done. And we also have a clear understanding of the partner that we need to work with. So, so like I said earlier, this is um, just my thoughts. So this is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to talk about modernizing production. And then I'm going to use the example of TAT. TAT was a concept three years ago. Today, it has become reality on the ground. It actually works. Then I'll talk about modernizing agro-processing, both spatial solutions and, um, and, and, and also technical solutions to modernizing ag agro-processing. Then modernizing marketing and distribution, very, very important. You know, the, the reason why African farmers are unable to get out of the, of, of, of the property cycle that they're in is because they don't have strong access to market. A market, in fact, there's a saying in Brazil that I like very much, the best fertilizer for any crop is a market. 
Then modernizing consumption. You know, you'd be surprised to learn that um, things like um, obesity are growing among African children, and, and also things like um, malnutrition, very well known, is, is actually on the rise again. So we have to think of how do we diversify the food basket so that we can ensure you know, the right you know, you know, you know, kind of nutrients are supplied to the population. And finally, modernizing food safety. This is a very important topic, given the fact that we now have the Africa free trade zone. I, I want to trade more amongst ourselves, but safety of food is so important. So, so to begin with, um, first of all, you know, Africa needs to raise its productivity. And to raise productivity, we need to put into the hands of farmers the very best technologies available. In, in other words, we need to build sustainable input markets and we need to regulate them. On the left-hand side, you see that there is a need to overcome the market failures. You know, Africa has more technologies you know, today than Asia had in the 1960s when the Green Revolution happened in Asia. But those technologies are not getting in the hands of farmers. So we need a, a, a means to overcome the failures of, of the markets, of input markets to get those things to farmers. What I call crop campaigns with terminate technologies. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. But we also need to, to be able to regulate those input markets, especially seed certification. You'd be surprised to know that many African countries don't even have laws around sale of certified seeds. Many also African countries also don't have you know, agencies to actually enforce those laws or to regulate, you know, you know, you know, you know what is being produced. Then Africa is 55 countries. We need to be able to harmonize, you know, movements of seeds and inputs across borders by harmonizing both the national and regional, you know, you know, you know seed laws. We also need, of course, investments in international and national agricultural research and extension systems. On the right hand side, we have to create a level playing field for everybody in the input market, from the private sector, to the farmers, to the, um, um, to, 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 to the service providers, we need to be able to provide, that's, that, that's the agro dealers, we need to be able to provide a conducive business environment for you to try. Otherwise, Martin, go ahead. Martin, yes. sorry, sorry, let me interrupt you a little bit. Uh, whoever is running the slides, we, we, we're still on the title slide, and yet Martin is in the middle of his presentation. Oh, oh, please, so I, I shared my who, own screen. Who is running the slides? Please move the slide. I, I actually shared my own screen. So maybe the person should, should just allow me to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can well, see we your can screen. See. You just need to uh, go full screen. OK. Yeah, you're already sharing it. Oh, you, you would need to be clicking on your slide. Yeah, but, but, okay, wait, but, but I'm on slide number three now. What can you see? Uh, we can only see the first slide. We see the time. Oh, no, then, then I'm not sharing my screen. I, I'm trying to share my screen. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, okay, let me, let me share from my hand here. Let me share it. Let me do it from here, please. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. I just thought it's good we see, so we can have both the virtual the okay. Okay. audio the, and the video. Can we, the, can we do the next slide, please? That, that's the, the outline. This is the outline I mentioned before. Okay, the, the, no, no, this slide, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so we need to create a level playing field for, for the private sector, and for the farmers, and for the agro dealers, you know, you know, with respect to, you know, to, you know, to inputs, not just seeds now, but even fertilizers, we have to be able to enforce, you know, the um, standards for the seeds and standards for the fertilizers. We also need to be able to, you know, you know, provide accreditation for agro dealers. It is not right for people to claim to be agro dealers but sell, you know, fake or, um, or expired products to farmers. And then we need to also support technology transfer and licensing. Can I, can I have the next slide? So as you have heard before, the technology for African agricultural transformation is a bold attempt to, to actually reverse you know, the market failures for seeds and other agro-inputs from the continent. 
by the bank being implemented by the city centers led by IITA. Nine commodities, rice, wheat, maize, sorghum, millet, high iron beans, foreign flesh, sweet potatoes, fish, poultry, small ruminants are the targets. And also the number of beneficiaries are 40, 40 million smallholder farmers. And there are also six enabler compacts, that's six um, groups also of enablers, policy, capacity development, water, soil facilities, and follow me one. I will just very, very quickly go over the success um, of, of tax. Just mention two, one in three actually, one in wheat and then um, one in maize and the one in the policy. You, you know, for wheat, the heat tolerant varieties of wheat that have been available since 2015, but not in the hands of farmers, Tart Wheat Compact was able to organize um, the government, the seed companies, extension, national agricultural research you know, project, and develop early generation seeds. 65,000 tons of early generation of certified seed eventually was, uh, pro was, was produced and, and distributed in Sudan and also in Ethiopia. In Sudan, they covered 294,000 hectares with this, and they moved Sudan from 24% Self-sufficiency to 50% self-sufficiency in, in wheat production. That's for me in three years. That actually is a major, major um, 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 achievement. And this also was repeated in Ethiopia, moving wheat into the dry, irrigated, you know, lowlands. 20,000 hectares, you know, was planted. Similarly, for maize, also drought-tolerant maize, 693,000 hectares was 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 was, was cultivated using 17,000 tons of um, climate smart maize seeds. Again. Working with the government, with seed companies, you know, the compacts, it, it was able to organize early generation seed production, demo trials, that's demand creation, and finally, you know, it, you know delivery of these seeds to farmers. On the policy side, it has been an attempt to harmonize policies so that varieties released in one country can easily be grown in, in several countries across the region. We've held meetings with Commerza, ECOWAS, and EAC, that's the, that's the policy compact now. And then they have beginning to also try to pass, you know, you know, laws in DRC and also uh, plant variety rights in, in Malawi. This, you know, this to me shows that this is not a concept. It can work as long as we just put our hearts and in, in, in our minds to it and work with the right partners. Partners like the research and development people, partners like government, partners like seed companies, it can actually help modernize production by providing the best inputs to farmers. So I will now move to the next, um, next, 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 next um, um, theme of modernizing processing. One thing we all know in Africa is that the cash crops, you know, seems to be doing very well. You know, their marketing is very organized. You know, it, it, the farmers produce and, and it's bought and, and, and it's processed. But for the ordinary crops like maize and cassava and then and then, and then, and then sorghum and rice, one thing you notice is the wide swings in price. Sometimes the price is really, really very high. Sometimes there's a glut, the price is very low. That, that, that suggests broken supply chains, broken value chains. We need to begin to look at how can we, you know, um, improve marketing and processing, terms of aggregation, process and marketing of whatever we produce in Africa. We should think of clustering farmers and processors along an infrastructure backbone so that the cost of moving produce from the farm to the processor it's not actually more than the cost of producing the crop. For many smallholder farmers in very rural areas, the cost of moving to the market is probably half or even more than producing the crop. Often when the prices are bad, we also have to also provide best practices to our farmers. So because there's no way processing can succeed if productivity is low on the, at the farm level. The, the best way for processing to succeed is when cost of the feed of the feedstock is competitive with, with the imported products. Otherwise, it will not succeed. So we really need to do this modernized processing by clustering production and value addition. Next slide, please. Something the bank has been doing recently is what we call a special agro-industrial processing zones. Here, we, 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 the, the, the whole concept is to use policy, infrastructure, and zone management to attract processors into areas of high production so that we can you know, add value to production that otherwise will have gone to waste or will have been imported from outside. And it has, it's, it's, the bank now has financed um, SAPZs in Togo, in Ethiopia. One is being processed from Nigeria in Senegal and several other countries. And we're beginning to find out that when you cluster production 
and processing, and also other things like input supplies and mechanization providers, you actually find much, much, you lower the transaction cost for both the processors and the, and, and the producers alike. This is working and we need to scale it up across the continent. Here you need very important partners like your private sector, you also need government because the policy comes from government. You also need you know, very, you know, very, very important, even the, the trade and the, and the Ministry of Industry people because they also have a role to play in, in such um, great economic zones. Next slide. Marketing and distribution. Once you have produced and you have processed, or even sometimes before you even process, maybe after the, the first primary process, you have to be able to deliver whatever you know you're producing to the consumer. In many con in con continents like in Brazil and especially in China and, and also in Pakistan, in India, the concept of wholesale markets is something that we need to really adopt in Africa because it's it's both a price discovery mechanism, one. And also, it's a mechanism to, to, to at least market safely perishable goods, too. And finally, it's also a mechanism to, to bring pharma and, 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 and off-taker together in a very efficient manner. We need to begin to think of wholesale markets across the continent to modernize marketing and distribution. We also need to think of the digital marketplace. During the lockdown, while Africa suffered, many other countries like, like, like in Europe and, and, and the US, Life continues as usual because people like Amazon. Amazon today sells three hundred and eighty-nine billion dollars worth of goods. The, the second largest wholesaler and retailer is actually um, Walmart. Walmart does only seventy-three billion. You know, almost five times. Um, in, in 1997, when um, when just the business was starting, Amazon. This was like you know, it was like a dream. But today. We know that your digital marketplaces are overtaking you know, brick and mortar marketplaces. We need to also in Africa and think about this. I'm happy to know that some, some companies in Kenya and also some companies in South Africa are also beginning to do this, whereby they actually have digital marketplaces for people to sell to them and, and also for, um, for, for, for them to be able to pay farmers. It is no longer, you know, you, you're going to a physical place. We, as Africans, we need to make smallholders accessible and um, provide access for, um, to customers for smallholder farmers. Next slide. This is a very important slide and I cannot emphasize enough. The trends actually are really worrisome. 58.7 million ch African children actually are stunted, lacking you know, sufficient nutrients. We have to, as a continent, you know, reverse the strength. Otherwise, we are creating a burden for the for the healthcare, you know, you know, you know, um, sector, and also for, you know, for for countries, children growing up, in, you know, without the ability of their, of their of, of their brains, you know, without the ability of their natural and um, 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 strength. We have to reverse this by diversifying the food basket. You know, I'm happy to see that aquaculture is one of the things um, being discussed here today. I'm also happy to note that um, and the, this year's World Food Prize went to aquaculture because aquaculture is one of the low carbon, low emission, you know, ways of diversifying, you know, the bread basket. We can actually, as a continent, put a lot of emphasis on, on, on fish and, 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 and help, you know, our, our children grow better and also help our, 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 our populations actually get the right nutrients. Let me just give you an example. In Ghana, you will be surprised that the most important source of protein actually is, is not chicken, it's not beef, it's fish. You know, and, and it, is, it is most important because it's probably is the most cheapest. We have to emphasize things like fish, vegetables, you know, um, and also fruits, modernized consumption. This has to be deliberate. There was a recent study by the MAMO panel, that's the Simon Pellier um, Malabo panel, and that showed that countries where there's a deliberate effort to diversify food and to ensure that mothers and, 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 and lactating women actually know how to you know, feed the children properly, actually see a, a big reduction in, a, in, a, in, a, in the malnutrition among children. It's something that, that has to be done at the government level and it has to be done at um, also the R&D level, you know, you know, to advise them. It has to be done also by the private sector. 
Again, the partners are clear, government, R&D, and also the private sector. Next slide. I'm coming to the end of my presentation, um, but, but this is the last thing I'd like to talk about, and it's food safety. Food safety is such an important point because often children eat, but all they eat is, is lost through diarrhea. Diarrhea from eating unsafe foods, either from eating food that are infected by, by bacteria or by, or, or, so by viruses. It's such an important topic that, that in, in many other, in African countries, we have very strong regulation of what can be eaten. The meat height is, um, is butchered and how it is sold, how it's transported. But in most of Africa, we don't have those regulations. We need very strong regulations from the, from the production to the processing to the marketing, everything. We have to be able to properly um, re um, 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 re regulate food so that we can reduce foodborne illnesses. Because otherwise, you can give children all the nutrients they want, but if they cannot retain it, then it, it becomes a, a big, big problem. Next, next slide. And this, this, this is my last slide. Africa now has what we call the free trade zone. You know, 55 countries trade among themselves. But there's, there are a lot of bottlenecks to you know, cross-border trade. It's not just um, the borders themselves and the difficulty of crossing the borders, but also food safety. Many a times, I, I remember Nestle approached the bank and complained that when they have to move the, 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 the products from Ivory Coast to Ghana or from Kenya to Tanzania, they meet all kinds of you know, um, 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 barriers just from the food safety regulation. And because there are no um, labs run by independent organizations like government or, or, or regional economic commissions, these, these, these products are difficult to move across in, in the border. So we really have to invest in a network of food safety laboratories. The bank is working with the AU you know, to invest in 11 of, of such laboratories because you cannot, we have to modernize you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, um, food safety by ensuring that we can you know, ensure the, the safety of food crossing borders. I'd like to stop here and thank again the organizers for inviting me. I also want to um, in, in recognize you know, the presence of, 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 of the, the DG. Thank you so much, DG, for um, the initiative in, taking, in, in, in hosting this meeting. Thank you, and um, back to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. Uh, Dr. Fregene, thank you so much because you've, uh, I think I was right when I said you were more than a Mr. Cassava improvement. Uh, you've shown the diversity of uh, areas of concern and expertise that you have shared with us. I like the four key areas you talked about, the importance of production, the importance of processing, the importance of marketing, and finally, the importance of nutrition in terms of food diversification, et cetera. I'm sure we would have an opportunity to see uh, questions that could come uh, later on. But at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage you, if you have a specific question for Martin, please go to the chat box and put it down. You know, just a question for Martin and then put down what that question is. For now, I want to introduce our keynote speaker number two. Uh, and the keynote speaker number two is Dr. Kenton Dashil. Kenton is a Deputy Director General Partnerships for Delivery with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. He was soybean breeder with this organization, the period 1983 up to 2001. And during that time, he worked mainly with national agricultural research systems to develop improved soybean varieties that were released in several African countries and being grown by smallholder farmers. He rose to become the director of the Crop Improvement Division at IITA. In the period 2001 to March 2012, Dr. Dashiell returned to his home country, the United States, where he occupied a number of senior positions, including as research leader 
and the USDA ARS North Central Agricultural Research Laboratory. He, however, returned to Africa and to IITA again in April of 2012 as Deputy Director General Partnerships for Delivery, which position he occupies as at now. It is a great pleasure to invite Kenton to share with us his thoughts in this key presentation. Over to you, Kenton. Thank you very much, Kwesi. It's indeed a, an honor and a pleasure to have this opportunity to have some uh, of my thoughts uh, shared with uh, this wonderful group of people. In fact, I see we have 145 participants now, so that's quite encouraging. Yeah, my title is Innovation and Partnerships for Strengthening African Food Systems. As Kwesi mentioned, I'm uh, employed by the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IITA, in Ibadan, Nigeria. And IITA is a member of the CGIAR. Um, we are one of 13 centers. And sometimes in my presentation, you'll hear me say something about the one CGIAR. It includes institutes that are based in Mexico and Colombia and Ethiopia and basically all over the world. Now, the Technologies for African Agriculture Transformation, TAT, is under the Feed Africa umbrella. And of course, one of the key leaders of this African Development uh, Bank program is uh, Dr. Martin Frigeni, who we just heard from. And uh, I'm going to try to build on what he has shared with us already this afternoon. The uh, Feed Africa uh, has two uh, main goals. One is to raise agriculture productivity, and the second one is to move African production to a much higher on the value chain. What we mean by this is not just uh, producing commodities, but adding value to those commodities. But I'll be focusing on the first uh, goal, which is to raise agriculture productivity, which is the focus for TAT. This map of Africa, Africa uh, shows us in dark green, those countries where um, TAT is actively involved. And we are working on nine commodities and um, Dr. Fajeni has already explained them. In this slide, I'm showing those nine commodities and beside each of their names, we have the institution that is leading the work. You'll see that many of them, such as Africa Rice, ICARDA, ICRASAT, IITA, SIAT, SIP, World Fish, and ILRI are members of the one CGIAR. And as Martin explained, these commodities, for them to be productive, there are some common things that they need, and that's what we call the enablers. These common um, areas that need to be strong to make these crops and livestock productive include soil and fertilizer, water management, capacity development, and technology outreach, youth. And I want to emphasize youth. So important for us to um, target the youth in everything we do. The fall armyworm, a terrible invasive pest, and policy. Ladies and gentlemen, the vision and the rationale of the TAT is to increase agriculture productivity and improve food systems across Africa by deploying proven agriculture technologies to farmers. And I should add also to other uh, sectors of the value chain. This will help us to radically transform African agriculture and improve nutrition security by through these nine commodities, which I've spoken of already. And when we say radically transform, what we really are thinking of is um, having livestock and crop production twofold to threefold increase over what the average farmers get today. This uh, partnership um, is uh, seeking to deliver a, a unique regional delivery infrastructure. And Martin, touched on this earlier when he talked about policies that would help us to move things freely across the borders in Africa. 
And so a good example of this would be in West Africa, where we look at countries like Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, uh, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria that are all next to each other. They have very similar agroecologies, which means they can grow uh, the same varieties. They can use the same fertilizers. They can have the same production techniques. Of course, every, every country will have their own ways of delivering these uh, knowledge and products to farmers, but they can all go, go across to all these borders. And also, as Martin said, we're looking to uh, target 40 million farmers. So uh, it's so critical to get the best innovations, the best technologies from the research institutes. And the TAT is getting these best technologies from the one CGIAR, from the private sector, from any place we can find the best technologies, and the NARS especially. And then the role of TAT is to take those best technologies and deliver them to the end users. Now, the guiding principles we're looking at is uh, just what I mentioned just now. Let's get the best technologies from wherever we can get them. Then let's deploy these solutions using dynamic partnerships with governments and the private sector. And Martin gave us good examples of that already. That was absolutely fantastic. And then uh, we will be using the full value chain approach from um, fertilizer to seed, to the farming practices, to the marketing, to the processing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the full value chain approach. And one of the ways that uh, TAT is uh, organized to deploy these best technologies is we've developed a technology catalog for the different crops and livestock. And I just, I'll give you a few examples of that. You can see that we've got the link here. And of course, we're gonna share uh, these presentations, including mine with everybody that's on the uh, virtual meeting. So you'll have these links available. Every uh, topic, or sorry, every commodity uh, on these catalogs has a table of contents. And I just wanted to show you in this uh, cassava catalog, we have 12 technologies that are proven to be highly productive and adoptable uh, by the end users. And they, they, you can see we address the whole value chain. Um, as you see, number one is all about varieties. Uh, for example, number six is about fertilizers. Number eight is about weed control. Uh, number nine is about, I'm sorry, number 11 is about the processing. So the whole value chain uh, is put here. And then you can see in the next slide, uh, we have a, a summary for each one. And I thought it was just interesting to show uh, the summary of cassava. In red, you see that um, when we combine um, the fertilizers, the weed control, the varieties, we increase cassava yields to 25 tons per hectare. And this is significant because because in most countries, the average yield is around nine or 10 tons per hectare. And if you scroll down, if you look down at the other red section there, I thought this was quite fascinating we find that manual harvesting of cassava requires 40 to 60 persons to harvest one hectare of cassava in a day. So you have a lot of people out there harvesting. But if you use the mechanized uh, planter, uh, well, well, this is the planter, but if you mechanize the harvest, you harvest three to five hectares in one day. And then in the, um, in the catalog, we can see the practical aspects here. This is the uh, planter that can plant uh, many hectares in a day. And on the next slide, we see the harvester that can harvest three to five uh, hectares of cassava in a day. I also want to show you a little bit about the maize a technology catalog. Um, and we also are showing here the, the um, table of contents, just like we did for cassava, where we're showing 10 different technologies, ranging from drought tolerant maize, to fertilizers, to controlling the fall armyworm, and even to controlling aflatoxin management uh, in the field. And look at this next picture here. It's just absolutely amazing when you compare the drought resistant to the drought susceptible uh, maize hybrids. On the left, we see the resistant. The one on the right definitely has, is gonna get a zero yield, where the one on the left will have quite a substantial and normal yield of maize. Um, 
I also am looking at the rice technology catalog. And just to quickly show you, one of the uh, innovations they have here is the thresher that you can see two men operating here can thresh, you know, easily um, uh, large quantities of rice that would take 25, 30, 40 people to thresh if they didn't have uh, a motorized thresher. So we have uh, many of these catalogs. Uh, and the next one I want to show you is the orange flesh sweet potato because it's so special that this orange flesh provides high vitamin A uh, to, the, to the people who eat it. And this is so important uh, for the children of Africa. As we described earlier, uh, the role of the private sector is so critically important. And actually we saw this as we are looking at the catalogs just now, because almost all of those things that we were showing as innovations needed to be produced by a private sector and sold. Seed, mechanized equipment, fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So private sector is absolutely required. And as we're listing here, it's even important in the urban and rural areas for the input and output markets. And, and Martin revealed this uh, quite well when he talked about the uh, staple crop processing zones. Um, also, the great thing about the private sector is it is sustainable. We all know that once a company is uh, producing a product and selling it, making a profit, farmers and others are buying those products and it's helping them to make their own profit. This is sustainable because everybody is winning. So for example, we need the private sector in the seed system, input, suppli input supplies, mechanization, et cetera. Ladies and gentlemen, the, we've seen how um, TAT is linking uh, to governments. And I want to go into that a little bit more detail. The, the TAT is actually a program that does only a small amount of work in a country. It is what we might call the core TAT. And um, these compacts, uh, the nine commodity compacts and the six enabler compacts will do some demonstrations. They'll have some partnerships in the country with government and private sector. And this is like a catalyst, a stimulus for the private sector and the government to take these to scale, to take what, what is demonstrated in maybe uh, five areas go ahead and, and demonstrate it in a thousand areas, get a million farmers to be doing it, get the private sector involved. So we, this, one of the critical things then is that we partner and with governments and also link into that, the um, African Development Bank, the World Bank, uh, EFAD and other organizations that can help um, give loans to countries to scale up these innovations on, in a massive way. So this is a very important partnership. Then to, to review just a little bit, uh, TAT is here to increase the productivity and I need to stress of existing farmland. Uh, we can solve all the food and nutrition problems in Africa using those fields that we're already using today. We don't need to clear more land. And of course, this is important rela related to uh, carbon sequestration and climate change. And we can do this when the farmers have the new technologies and the new innovations and they're using them. And we put a lot of emphasis on sustain sustainable practices. Those These practices ensure that the land that the farmers are using today will remain productive will remain uh, viable for hundreds and hundreds of years. We have emphasized the private sector involvement and we've talked about that. And we've talked about African governments when in partnership with TAT and the international financial institutions like AFDB, um, we can make great, great progress. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we can't disclose everything today, but uh, I'm showing you a link here I would encourage you to click on that one when you have a chance because it's all about a call to action and partnerships. It'll give you ideas about how you can get involved more and more in transforming African agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, innovative agriculture puts money in farmers' pockets and makes food systems more sustainable and improves nutrition security. You're going to hear more 
interesting stories and information about TAT uh, from our panelists in just a few minutes. And finally, um, you are welcome actually to join TAT and work together with us to transform African ag agriculture. Thank you all very much. And I hand it back to our moderator, Dr. Kwesi Atakra. Kenton, thank you so much. This is really exciting. Uh, and it links very well with what we heard from Martin. Uh, it seems the two of you must have put your heads together to make sure that we are getting the full picture. Uh, I like the point you raised that the technologies that we're talking about in TAT are not just technologies developed by the CG centers, but these are technologies developed by a whole spectrum of organizations, including private sector and other groups. Um, and what we do in TAT is to create the platform that enables these technologies to be usable. And you've highlighted the catalog as one example of the instrument that we use. I also like the emphasis you have given us on the importance of partnerships at the different levels. So thank you uh, very much for that uh, exciting and insightful presentation. At this point, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the point where we want to see um, how engaged our participants are. Um, and I'll be calling on uh, Sabra shortly uh, to let us know if there are any questions that have been posted that she would like to, you know, to raise. We, we can, if there are too many, we can't handle all. But even if we get some two uh, questions uh, for now, it will, be, it will be useful to do that. Um, so let me pass it on to Sabra. Uh, Sabra, please take the floor and let us know if there's anything in the chat box that you want to alert us on. Uh, please unmute Sabra. I think yeah, she's, yeah, you can, she's you can muted. Go. Tunde, yes, please unmute Sabra. Yes, hello. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my camera is not working, so please excuse me for that. But I have two questions for Dr. Fregene uh, that came in when he was speaking. And this has to do with the examples that he was talking about, about wheat and maize. And the questions that came have to do with making sure that we get the best technologies to the countries. Um, how, how is that done? How do we ensure that the right varieties and the best technologies are deployed? And how do we ensure that the country investments that are deploying these are actually getting these crops um, to the farmers? That's the first question. The second question is, what is the role of the AFC FTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area Framework? Um, what is the role of this in the transformation process? I guess this also relates to how the RECs, what role the RECs play in this um, as we move to transform the agriculture sector on the continent. So I would like to pose those two questions, open it up to Dr. Fregene, please. Martin, if you are there, can you give your comment on the first one is basically addressing the issue of how do we actually ensure that the best um, technologies and the best uh, uh, processes that we develop do get to farmers and they want to know what sort of process. But then the second one is linked to the Africa Continental uh, free trade area agreement. Uh, how do you see this playing out in relation to that? I think Great. we lost. Uh, yeah, Kwesi, I think uh, uh, Martin has had some difficulty, technical difficulty, but I'd be glad to take that first question. Okay. Yeah. Um, about how do we ensure yeah. that. I think you yeah. should take that first question. Aha, uh -huh. thank you very much. That's fine. So the way we ensure that we have, for example, the best varieties or the best innovations that are available is um, we, uh, we partner with the research institutes that have the best, I would call them scientists and experts that uh, have 
been studying these things, making sure that they're the best for the particular agroecology or country where they're working. Uh, and so we rely on them and their experience to do that. Um, and um, then I think that links to uh, how do we make sure that uh, the farmers have access to these. Uh, and again, this is now working with private sector and governments, uh, like we talked a little bit about in my presentation. So, so one is partnerships with the research researchers to get the best materials, and then partnerships with governments and the private sector to deploy them to the end users. Thank you, Kwesi. Thank you very much, Kenton. Uh, with regard to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, uh, this is a huge development uh, that is being driven by the Africa Union, and it makes it possible for the links to be established to improve uh, intra I mean, inter-country marketing and trade. So obviously, it does make a lot of opportunities available, uh, but this is something that within TAT, uh, I believe there will be a lot of uh, focus uh, linking with our policy enabler team because they are also involved in finding out how best to take full advantage of this process to be able to advance the course of agricultural transformation. I know there are so many other questions, um, but I would plead with all of you that we move on. Um, and then towards the end, when we have the general discussion, we can touch on some of the other questions. So we move into the second part of the, of the session where we're now going into the panelists uh, sessions. And as I indicated earlier, we have three panelists. So permit me to introduce these three panelists uh, so that we would know who we are dealing with. Um, the first panelist to be introduced is Dr. Ramajita Tabo. Dr. Tabo is the regional director, ICRISAT West and Central Africa, based in Mali. Prior to this, he was deputy executive director for FARA, based in Accra, Ghana. He won several awards, one of which is a prestigious 2007 Nobel Peace Prize as a member of the International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. He coordinated the Desert Margins Program, which was aimed at arresting land degradation and conserving biodiversity in Sub-Saharan Africa. His technical expertise spans a number of dimensions, but also includes integrated crop livestock system. So we are very lucky to have him. He comes with a lot of experience, especially look, looking at agricultural development issues in the drier parts of our continent. The second panelist is Professor Bernadette Fregene. Uh, Professor Fregene lectured in Department of Aquaculture and Fisheries Management. <laughs> as a professor of extension and economics for 21 years. Previously, she worked with Federal Department of Fisheries, Nigeria. Currently, a scientist of World Fish and also as TAT Aquaculture Compact Leader, Professor Fregene facilitates implementation and monitoring of TAT aquaculture value chain activities in 12 African countries. She's based in the World Fish Nigeria office, which is located on the IITA compound. Last but not the least is Dr. Robin Burushara. Robin is a senior advisor to the Pan-Africa Bean Research Alliance, PABRA, a partnership facilitated by the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT. Previously, Robin was a director of PABRA for quite a number of years as a scientist of SEAT in Africa. He has over 30 years experience in agricultural research for development, 
with particular interest in development and dissemination of being based technologies. His professional focus is on developmental impact through partnerships and policy influence that support being value chain actors to exploit innovative opportunities to improve their livelihoods sustainably. So ladies and gentlemen, here are your three panelists and uh, I'm really excited that they are with us this afternoon. I'm going to pose a series of questions to them. And uh, as they answer these questions, I want to remind you once again of the use of the chat box. And for those of you who came uh, a bit late, uh, also find the link for the Mentimeter, which is posted in the chat box. I will want uh, Tunde to repost that link so that it doesn't go too far and easy to, to identify in the chat box. But for now, we're gonna focus on our panelists. And my first question, which will have to be addressed by all the three panelists uh, is this. You are the leader of a commodity compact, a program within TAT or you are associated with a program within TAT. So what exactly does this mean? If we're talking about compacts in TAT and all that, what exactly does it mean um, for somebody who is not familiar with the inner workings of TAT? How would she understand the program that you are running? So I will first of all, invite uh, Professor Fregene uh, Bernadette. So you take the floor in a very brief uh, two, maximum three minutes. Just tell us what this aquaculture uh, compact that you lead, what it's all about. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Compact means the entire ecosystem of stakeholders and their resources including international and national research organizations, government agencies, private sector actors, and other partners along the value chain. I lead the one, I lead one of the nine I lead one of the nine commodities, which is fish, and it focuses on aquaculture development. The aquaculture Compact aims at increasing fish production and productivity through identification and deployment of appropriate proven aquaculture technologies under the leadership of Wallfish. The target, therefore, is to ensure self sufficiency in fish production and a reduction in fish importation through sustainable. In intensification of existing small, medium enterprises and large scale aquaculture businesses. For now, we operate in 12 African countries, as you were told. In the past three Bernadette, years- would you, mind, would, you, would you mind, Bernadette, sorry to interrupt. Would you mind turning on your video, if it's possible? Oh, the video is on. Okay, you go ahead then. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Continue. The video was on. I've tried it today. Okay. Okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. Just continue. Probably the problem okay. may be from my end. Yes, because I've tried it today. So in the past three years, the compact has built capacity, demonstrated and disseminated, as well as deployed proven world fish aquaculture technologies. We plan therefore to take technologies to scale through partnership with private sector investors, the government and regional economic communities. In summary, the technologies that we are disseminated include fast-growing disease resistance, 
quality fish seed and proven fish rearing technologies for tilapia and catfish, as well as the hybrid of heterobranchus and claria species. The second technology is the quality low-cost fish feed using locally available raw materials. And the third is the improved post-harvest technologies and fish product development and differentiation, which is value addition along the aquaculture value chain. I can go on and on, but let me stop for now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Bernadette, for giving us an insight on uh, what this aquaculture compact is all about. Um, we want to have the same uh, response also coming from um, Dr. Burushara. Dr. Burushara, can you also address the same issue uh, in relation to the compact that you are associated with? Thank you very much, moderator. <clears throat> And a good afternoon, good evening, uh, participants. Yeah, the high end bean is a compact led by the Alliance of Biovast International and SEAT through the partnership of the Pan African Bean Research Alliance. This is a research for development partnership in about 32 countries in Africa. Now, I had the privilege of working as the director of PABRA, as has been said. And during that period, I had also the privilege of getting involved in the design of the High Iron Bean Compact, uh, which is, was considered as one of the priority commodities and the tax. Currently, the Commodity Compact is led by uh, Dr. Josie Kamanda, who I acknowledge having contributed to this presentation. The question is why beans? Uh, it's known Beans is one of the staple crop in parts of East and Southern Africa, and some in Central Africa and in, in, in West Africa too. It's a, a source of income and is also a contributor in nutrition. Uh, high iron bean is active in eight countries of TAT. This includes Burundi, DR Congo, Kenya, Malawi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. Now, the high iron bean varieties have been identified or specifically bred for biofortification, biofortified uh, for high iron and zinc. Now, is a, a particular effort that has been done to have a special beans that can have micronutrients, and in this particular case, iron, which makes it very easy to deliver some of these micronutrients to those who eat and use them. When consumed, they contribute to addressing iron deficiency. And you know, iron is one of the major deficiencies and effect causing a lot of health effect in children and also in mothers who have low iron in their blood. Now the high and bean compact plays a role to exploit the partnership of PABRA to mobilize different actors. These are public, the government, research organization, and uh, importantly, the private sector and development partners to scale up and uh, deliver some of the technologies that are associated with iron beans, in particular, high bean varieties, but to enhance productivity, complementary research products like uh, you know, GAP method, good agricultural practices in these eight countries, particularly those which have released. Now associated with this are a number of technologies that could be explained later, but this is the gist of the high iron bean uh, compact in Andatar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Emphasizing the critical uh, value of this high. So it's not just about beans, but this is really an enriched bean uh, with iron and zinc. 
incorporated into it. So it's very exciting. And uh, thank you for, for sharing um, what that compact is all about. Um, I'd like to move on into another question. As we know, we are in a year of food systems. And therefore, we want to be sure that the kind of work that is going on, it contributes to the goals of this food system uh, summit that is being run by the United Nations. So I, I would like a couple of uh, panelists to basically touch on how they can briefly, and I want to underline the word briefly, how they can briefly highlight two clear achievements of your program. We've heard a bit about you know, what you do, but we want you to put your finger on two things where you can say, these are good areas that we have achieved some, some uh, we have made some achievement in these areas and, and they strengthen, they help to strengthen uh, food systems. So first I'd like to call uh, Professor uh, Fregena again. Uh, Bernadette, can you please begin on this particular question? I'm sorry, uh, I can't get the video on, <laughs> but I'll continue. So, yeah, don't, so far. Yeah, don't worry, just, just we, can, we can hear you. Okay. The compact has been engaged in number one, capacity building, and then secondly, physics supply with efficient production system in the 12 implementing countries so far. In terms of capacity building, we have trained over 23,000 aquaculture value chain actors on pond and hatchery management, handling and processing, storage and preservation, as well as product development for household consumption. Secondly, the supply of improved broodstock and fish feed has been provided to our partners for increased fish seed production, which is over 159 million fingerlings of catfish and tilapia. Specifically in the third aquaculture compact program, Kenya has produced over 34 million monosex tilapia, monosex male tilapias and 8 million catfish fingerlings. Zambia has also produced over 26 million monosex male tilapia, while Nigeria has augmented extra 51 million catfish and tilapia fingerlings, among several others. The efficient production systems include the impound raceway, which is able to yield 60 kilograms per meter cube per cell, and in eight months can produce 120 kilograms per meter cube per cell, and each IPRS has three cells. So you can imagine when you times 120 kilogram by three, then you can imagine what you have per meter cube for the three cells with average weight of 350 to 400 grams. And Kenya has adopted this technology. The tilapia cage culture system with the HAPA system has also been used in open water bodies and produces a yield of 34 kilogram per meter square with average weight of 600 grams and with higher survival of fingerlings. These proven production systems have been adopted in Cameroon, DRC, Ghana, and Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh for showing all that uh, achievements, uh, starting with capacity building, but then ending with the, what you might want, you know, a layman might call the fish seed. Uh, in this case, the finger lanes that have been produced in there and giving us some uh, yield um, increased gains that have been made in different countries. Thank you uh, very much. Um, at this point, I want to call Dr. Tabo. Uh, Ramajita Tabo, and uh, also ask him 
to tell us a bit about where he is coming from in relation to this TAT compact business and what, which ones he is engaged in and what the key focus of that is. So Tabo, can I pass it on to you, please? Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, Gracie, I, I thought you were forgetting about the sorghum and millet compact, but uh, I think you, I can see your <laughs> strategy is to combine both questions together. So um, okay. I will, <laughs> this is the icebreaker. Um, you know, I, ICRISAT is leading the compact on uh, sorghum and per millet. Uh, Professor uh, Fregene has done a good job of defining what a compact is. So I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, I would just like to start by saying that uh, this compact is led by Dr. Dukbeji Fatonji, who is an agronomist based with us here at ICRISAT in uh, Bamako. And uh, he is the compact leader, but I have been associated with the development of that right from inception. So I work very closely with him, giving him whatever support he needs in terms of uh, linking to partners, to government officials and others. And that's why uh, I'm talking uh, here mostly uh, on behalf of my colleague, uh, Patonji. Uh, Permillet and sorghum are often referred to as the cool men's crop, but uh, in actual fact, they're very important crop. They're the main staple food crop, uh, especially in the Sahelian uh, countries. That's, that's the zone where rainfall is between about 500 to 700 millimeter of rainfall. They're very hardy crops. Uh, more than 80% of cultivated areas in those zones are cultivated to uh, uh, sorghum and millet, and more than 50% of food consumption of the rural people is uh, from uh, these two crops. So those are crops of the future, we believe, because sorghum and millet are rich in iron and zinc, and I'm happy that uh, Robin was talking about uh, the iron and by fortification in beans and also in sorghum and millet, we also are engaged in getting some of these uh, materials or crops that are very rich in uh, 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 iron and zinc. And they address the issue of uh, diabetes and the issue of uh, anemia and others. So very important crops. So the overall objective of this uh, compact is really to improve food security and the livelihoods of farming families uh, through sustainable intensification of uh, these crops and land and better profit, profitability of both crops. I think that's also important to mention here, the intensification, that's what we're after, sustainable intensification. How can you really grow uh, the crop and get uh, yield in the same area with very little amount of uh, rainfall and inputs? Uh, we work uh, through innovation platforms in seven countries, uh, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, and Sudan. Uh, we work, uh, some of the work that we do is to enhance seed sector through best genotypes and best bet uh, nutrients, water management, and good agronomic practices and IPM options. We also focus uh, on building farmers' capacities with uh, proven technology because they are the ones who will make this system sustainable. So they need to be familiar with all the technologies that go, uh, the practices that go along with it. And to address the challenge of low productivity, and uh, production uh, and increase value chain efficiency or reduce uh, the post-harvest losses. We then uh, provide uh, uh, packages to farmers from which they can choose things like fertilizer, microdosing, water collection uh, with uh, techniques like design system that partners uh, develop. So uh, in nutshell, uh, we, the, 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 the sorghum and millet compact follows the same principle as the other compacts of working closely with partners, private sector, extension agents and farmers to improve the yield of sorghum and millet. And so far we have materials that can yield more than 40% than the local, uh, locally adapted land races or the uh, improved varieties for the hybrids that are by fortified. So uh, in summary, that's what I uh, can say about uh, the sorghum and millet compact. Uh, Kwesi, over to you. Thank you to, uh, to you, Ramajita, for that. I mean, sorghum and millet is such an important crop, especially with these challenges we are facing of dryness and all that, or helping us to know the direction in which this work is going. 
Um, I want to get back to Robin and challenge him to also tell us. He talked so much about this high ion beam and the zinc and beans and all that. But I want to ask him to put his finger on two very specific achievements that he can say, this is what is coming out of the work and it is leading to solving the challenges of uh, food security in this particular environment. So Robin, over to you. Thank you, Kwesi. Uh, I like to emphasize on or highlight two elements. One is regard on what we have been able to do to intensify production, marketing and consumption. I like to point out that in doing this, we have used what we call the Pabras Commodity Corridor Approach. This is where our efforts are focused on the production. We have three hubs, production hub, uh, influence the demand hub, and also the linkages in marketing. Now, in doing this, uh, we've had to sub seek private investors in supporting delivery of proven technologies. And in this process, we show some examples of those achievements. For example, we've had activity in the production hubs a particular example we can give is in Zimbabwe, where high iron bean varieties combined with good agricultural practices have increased productivity in the sites that uh, the compact works in. Uh, this has improved yield from 0 0.6 tons per hectare to 1 or to 1.4 tons per hectare. In Burundi, similarly, we see in the production hub where efforts have been emphasized in scaling up the technologies of this uh, compact, we've had yield increasing to 1.8 tons per hectare, whereas in other areas, the average is 0 0.7. Now, the other elements with this is enhanced commercialization and processing capacity for value added products in the consumption area. An example I'll give is a, a private sector called Totahara in Burundi that has progressively increased value addition of high iron beans, particularly in developing bean flour. And this bean flour is targeting children in schools through partnership with the development agencies. Now to deliver the, the, the technologies we have, seed is a critical element. And in delivering this, uh, we've been able to reach over 900 and uh, close to say 1 million beneficiaries with high iron, seed of high iron varieties, which translates to about 10,000 metric tons. And this is associated with complementary technologies, and this is per match. But the other element I would like to highlight briefly is really having worked uh, with governments to mobilize them to invest and commit resources to supporting scaling up of iron beans. An example I like to highlight here is how we have been able to influence nutrition policies in Tanzania and in Zimbabwe to include these high iron beans in school feeding programs. And in this respect, in Tanzania, in two which started up in 2018, it's been possible to scale up access of iron beans to about 205 schools in 20 districts, targeting about 200,000 school children. Similarly, we have other governments investing or counties in Kenya uh, investing their resources to support the scaling up of iron beans based on the importance that they attach to these iron beans. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robin. Uh, it's also very exciting. I'm sure if we had time, we would have gone into a lot of detail on some of these exciting achievements. Um, we still have questions that the panelists are going to address, but 
I want to pause for a while and uh, engage our you know, broader participants. I see that there is a very active uh, engagement on the chat box. And uh, first of all, uh, Tunde, I want you to give uh, a voice to Isaac Malaya. Isaac Malaya, please authorize him to be able to, to talk because I'm, I'm, I'm just going to um, ask Isaac uh, to express what he has expressed already in the tax, in the, in the chat box. Um, so that uh, we just want to, and this relates to aquaculture. Isaac, can you take it up? I'm just giving you so one minute to just share with us the key point you have raised in relation to aquaculture. Isaac, please go ahead. You can omit yourself. Isaac, are you there? Okay. All right. It looks like Isaac Malaya is okay. no longer there. Um, I think I'm connected. Yes. Uh, my first uh, contribution in, on aquaculture is, uh, you know, we've been talking so much. I appreciate, like, in my country, Zambia, the government is working so hard in uh, improving aquaculture sector. Now, the challenge is that I feel we can, we will not be able to meet that target of, uh, you know, being able to supply, feed ourselves as Zambians and probably be able to export because when we look at uh, the technologies we are using, the production systems we are using, I think we cannot meet those, uh, you know, benchmarks. And uh, secondly, uh, when we look at the escalating costs of uh, fish feed, I think that is one very big hindrance to you know, productivity in the aquaculture sector because the aquaculture sector is now seen as a very expensive probably uh, sector to venture into, especially when we look at uh, feed. Let us also look at probably increasing productivity because when we look at these countries that are exporting fish to Zambia, they are not using probably eight fish per cubic meter as talking densities, they've gone way far beyond that density. So we need also to look at this. And this entails that enhancing our productivity, employing uh, probably mechanizing our production systems, just as we've been able to see a mechanization in agriculture. So I think those are my two pertinent contributions I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Isaac. I, I saw your post and I thought it would be good to, to mention it uh, in this situation. Uh, two key things you have said, uh, one is technology, that we cannot use the same old technologies and expect to reach these targets that we have. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Professor Frejene to basically comment on that very briefly, whether the kind of technologies that the aquaculture group is dealing with is the same old technologies or he, they've been able to show that some good uh, progress has been made uh, in relation to aquaculture. And then secondly, he says, it's not just a question of the production of the, the fish and the fingerlings and all that, but a critical issue is the feed. He says the feed item is making it so expensive. So how do you relate to this? And, and please, let's be very brief on that. Over to you, uh, Bernadette. Okay, thank you, Isaac, for your comments. I want to remind you that some people came from Zambia and we took them to Abasa, Egypt. That's the World Fish uh, Research Station and where they were made to understand how to use the HAPA system to produce more fingerlings, tilapia, uh, monosex fingerlings. We, they were taught on the production system the Egyptians have used that made them to increase their production to over 1 million and 300,000 me metric tons of tilapia annually. So 
there are some Zambians who participated in that training and they took that technology to Zambia and they have been stepping down that training and training other Zambians. So we have this technology, the use of the HAPA system, the use of the cage culture system, the, and the use of probiotics to ensure higher for survival of fingerlings, as well as those who that will grow up to become the table size. Now, the issue of fish feed is the same story all over. And in aquaculture compact, we have disseminated the technology of using locally available raw materials to compound feed. That is what we are using in Nigeria. Actually in Egypt also, they don't use as much fish meal for tilapia. You know, tilapia doesn't need as much fish meal as catfish. They don't use as much. And that is what they do in Egypt, that the price of fish feed in Egypt is the lowest in Africa. And they, the, the people who went to Egypt were also taught this technology. And in Nigeria, right from 2MM, farmers have been taught to compound their own feed with the local ingredients like cassava peels and other things. To, and by doing that, mm. you can generate at least 30% additional uh, 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 profit margin. Okay, excellent. I think these are very important uh, issues and uh, it basically highlights that the feed is a critical area for us to, for the, you know, the compact to, to work on and also to show visibility in, uh, in terms of its reporting. It's because it's uh, a key part of the profits one can make. Okay, let me now go back to the panelists. And this time I want to cause us to reflect on the climate change and all the challenges that we are having, including the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as a result of all this crisis, there is one word which is becoming very, very commonly used these days. And that is the word resilience. Everybody is saying, you know, you've got to have resilience in the food systems, resilience in agricultural systems. So my question to uh, Dr. Ramajita Tabo is, how does the issue of resilience play out in the work that is done in the compact that he is associated with? Uh, yes, thanks again, uh, uh, Kwesi. You're right, this is a uh, uh, real concern to all of us, climate change. Uh, that uh, is an issue that should be addressed by the whole planet, in fact, even uh, the climate uh, skeptics. You must have heard of the uh, latest report of the IPCC that indicates that we are not doing uh, good at all. If the trend in which we are continues, that uh, we are going to lose almost uh, all the biodiversity, animal as well as plant biodiversity. So it's a real issue. So in our compact, uh, we take that into consideration. And um, you mentioned the issue of uh, resilience, which is really to avoid that uh, the system breaks down, how farmers can cope to climate change effects. Uh, sorghum and millet are naturally uh, adapted to harsh environment and uh, drought as well as uh, uh, other environmental uh, factors. So uh, they have this inbuilt uh, uh, characteristic of uh, striving on very little amount of water because if you see in Niger or Mali where millet is grown, you're talking about about 500 millimeter of rainfall. So they're already adapted, but uh, they cannot still uh, cope with uh, the extreme shocks and extreme events. Because when we talk of climate change effect, we're talking about the extreme events where you have flooding, you have extreme drought. And sometimes some of those systems that are even uh, adapted, tolerant to drought uh, can break down. So how do we bring that into our work? Uh, we work very closely with uh, all the key stakeholders that are involved in uh, improving or helping the farmers to improve its productivity. 
that could be the extension agents, uh, private sector, uh, the government uh, officials, NGOs, to deploy the materials that our breeders develop, how they, I mean, those materials that are improved. For example, we have now uh, uh, sorghum and uh, millet varieties that are much earlier maturing than those that uh, have been extended in the past uh, uh, 10 years. So they can escape a terminal drought, uh, thereby uh, giving some enough grains for farmers to, to harvest and not really completely lose their crop. We have materials that are uh, tolerant to diseases and other biotic stresses. And uh, by working with the farmers to also give them information on the uh, weather, uh, using uh, decision support uh, tools, uh, IT tools and uh, weather forecasting or uh, uh, information uh, services. We give them the information on weather that will enable them to plan their ag agricultural activities uh, appropriately in terms of for when, what crops to use, when to plant, when to weed their crops, when to apply fertilizer, when to harvest. All these things are combined package or technology can help the farmer to increase his resilience to all these uh, extreme shocks. So the compact uh, on sorghum and millet uh, is uh, putting in all those different elements uh, to ensure that we really uh, strengthen the resilience of the farmers. So creation and delivery of climate smart varieties and good agronomic practices to farmers. Uh, we use also, as I said, the science support system, but capacity building of farmers is also quite important. With the COVID-19 pandemic that you mentioned, it's another challenge. Uh, we have dealt with this issue in 2020 by uh, working with farmers and making seeds available to them of sorghum and, and uh, millet seeds that they can use. And also using, again, the IC tools to get the information to them so that they can uh, cope with the situation. So in a nutshell, this is uh, the kind of uh, strategy and the kind of package that we put together to strengthen and the resilience of uh, farmers in the face of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as well as uh, climate change effects. Thank you and over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ramajita, for giving us a sense of, obviously the issue of climate change is with us. It's been with us for a while and uh, it's not something that is gonna go away quickly uh, if it's ever going to go away. So making sure that technologies um, are resilient. It's, it's a very important uh, part. Uh, because of time, I'm going to twitch the question that I'm going to pose to Robin, uh, because now I want Robin to reflect on the fact that we are in the period of the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And uh, in fact, the main event is taking place in September and uh, we would have um, governments and countries and all kinds of donor agencies and, you know. So my question to you, Robin, is uh, do you see any opportunities um, for the compact that you are working on uh, as a result of what this UN Food System Summit has generated all the excitement that has been generated. Do you, where do you see the connectivity between that and the potential uh, impact that one can get from the work that is being done through your compact and even through that? I'd like you to address that. And uh, when you finish, I'll also pose the same question to Bernadette. Thank you, Kwesi. Uh... As I mentioned earlier, we use a PABRA corridor approach. That is really having the value chain approach, uh, having demand drive the production and the marketing. But then the point is that uh, we have these actors that are involved in the actions of, at different stages of the value chain. So there is an effort to coordinate that process. This approach which we use for high iron bean is very well aligned with the food systems concept. And it encompasses activities and actors involved in producing, 
iron bills. In processing, like the example that I've given, obviously in transporting the products and delivery from the source to where it's consumed, really using the food system you know, you know, concept. Now the objective of the high iron beams compact are also well aligned with the, the action tracks of the UN Food uh, uh, System Summit. For example, there is interest to ensure access to safe and nutritious food uh, for all. And uh, our efforts in delivering nutritious high and bean varieties is, is, is aligned to that, to that. Boosting of nature positive production of the beans themselves. And we are using that in high iron beans to develop, of course, the, the, the varieties and the seed for consumption, but also in developing uh, bean-based products from a value addition approach. There is also an element to really equate, you know, advance equitable livelihood, where in high end beans, we are considering women, the youth production and service provision, processing and marketing. And of course, we are talking about building resilience, which you just uh, mentioned, uh, Dr. Tabo has mentioned, and, and, and in iron beans, we are also concerned with technologies of iron beans that are cli uh, climate smart research products. Now, to link this with the question you've mm -hmm. asked, it's expected that the outcome from the United Nations Food System Summit will include resolutions along the above action uh, tracks that I've mentioned. And we expect that maybe with commitments from governments, from development partners, will be that of increasing investment in scaling up some of the TAT programs and the delivery of, uh, of, of, of what we are doing under that and all the associated technology. So what I see, the link then is that with that effort, can we start or higher and beans benefit from uh, those actions which are for the UN Food System uh, Summit and, 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 and apply to what we are doing in TAT. And with that kind of alignment, we should be able to promote the effort we are doing and be able to achieve the objectives that the, the summit is interested in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's very important, especially the latter part of what you've just said, you know, how these outcomes are potentially going to help to change situations on the ground with countries and strengthen country engagement in some of these key areas. Uh, Tabo, uh, Dr. Ramajita Tabo, I, I would also like you to comment on this same thing. You know, how are we going to ride on the waves that will be created from this uh, UNFSS? Yeah, I think to build on what uh, Robin just said, we expect that this food summit is going to draw together a lot of uh, expertise, people with uh, from different uh, uh, categories, uh, scientists, uh, extension agent policy makers. And I think one of the key things that we can get out of this summit will be uh, to widen our uh, network of partners, uh, partners to link with them so that we can interact with them even after the summit to see how we can uh, share experiences, share ideas, and uh, so that we can uh, uh, strengthen the work that we're doing uh, in that uh, in terms of uh, improving productivity of uh, the rural farmers in the countries where we're working. Uh, what is also important that we can really tap on is uh, particularly the policy decision that may come out of it in terms of, uh, and also uh, the funding commitment. We hope that uh, there will be some kind of um, opportunities to jointly develop proposals and get more funding that will enable us to put on the table and work with with uh, our various partners. So policy issues, the private sectors that uh, we can also uh, 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 partner with. So th there are quite a few things that we can get, but the main thing is really that network uh, that uh, of uh, key stakeholders that we can build on and tap on to move forward. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. That's very exciting. Lots of good opportunities. So we see avenues that we can use to advance the course of uh, Feed Africa and the course of the other uh, food systems initiatives and concerns uh, that we all have. Um, ladies and gentlemen, because of uh, time which is running very, very fast against us, I want to move to a participant's engagement and I'm asking uh, Atai and, and Sabra, uh, basically there may be one or two questions in the chat box that you would want to, to highlight. At the same time, I am asking uh, our Zoom manager to get ready with the Mentimeter question so that uh, we'll go straight into that. So first of all, let me call uh, Atai. Let me call Atai to see if there is one key question that you want to put on the platform for us to look at. Okay, thank you very much, um, Kwesi. We have a couple of engagements from the Facebook, uh, live streaming from the YouTube, and also from this Zoom platform. A couple of questions which uh, myself and Sabra have harmonized, and I'll be presenting them just uh, quickly. Uh, the first set of two questions actually relates to Martin and uh, Ken Dashil. And um, Mary says that Ken Dashil said TAT brings the technologies to countries and expects partnerships within countries to upscale. Uh, it takes quite some time for the adoption of technologies. How long will TAT be around in this good work? And uh, Funke reiterates that uh, how can the approach given by Dr. Dashil help in addressing the systemic barriers affecting adoption and scaling of innovations in the countries. Um, then with regards to the panelists, we, we have a lot of questions for aquaculture, but uh, Evaristo, Evaristo, from, Evaristo says that fish has great potential for improved nutrition. How is the fish aquaculture compact taking into account social inclusion, that is gender and youth? Uh, Emery from the Delta State University says, how can the Faculty of Agriculture, Delta State University, Nigeria, be linked to that? Uh, Udunobong says that, uh, thanks all the presenters for an expository presentation. And you would like to know how young aquaculturists like himself in the south southern part of Nigeria benefit from that aquaculture program. Uh, Rotimi is asking, why is plantain not part of uh, tart selected crops? Uh, Theo wants uh, directs this question to all the panelists. How do we incentivize the private sector actors to scale up tax proven technologies? Uh, Daniel would like to know which food safety components are included in maize, sorghum, millet, and the HIV technologies. Uh, with regards to comments, we have just two. Uh, one from Jim, uh, powerful strategy to scale up working through policy to get the iron rich beans into homegrown school feeding programs. Same can be done for vitamin A, maize and other biofortified crops. And then Lawrence Kent says that the progress in scaling up access to high iron beans is a great example of the power of the tart compacts. So in addition to these questions, before the panelists uh, respond, uh, I would like to add that uh, a couple of TATS commodity and enabler compact coordinators have been engaging uh, on the chat box with key responses to some of the questions that have been raised. So those questions have not been uh, reflected here because the compact coordinators from policy, Sokam and Millet, Maze have done considerable justice to them. Thank you very much, moderator. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Atai. Obviously, we're not gonna answer all these questions. Uh, I just want to thank all of you who have provided these questions and the comments. Actually, it's a lot more than what Atai has been able to run through, uh, but it's very enlightening to see that people have been uh, connected to what uh, you know the discussions that have been going on and have raised all these questions. I have them listed, but we will have the full 
uh, list of the, the chat box also printed out. And uh, we will be working on these as we move ahead. Because of time, I really regret, but I'll have to uh, skip the last exercise we were going to do uh, because I would like us to get a closing uh, remark. Having participated in this whole process from the very beginning, seeing the keynote presentations as well as the panel session, which I found very, very uh, engaging, you know, and uh, I would like now to call um, Innocent Musabi Amana. Uh, Innocent is the head of the TAT Clearing House. Now that's a word that you probably haven't heard much of during this session. So I would ask Innocent when he comes on to really tell us what is this clearing house and what are they clearing? Um, and then also give uh, some closing remarks and uh, that will take us to the conclusion of this uh, session. So Innocent, let me leave the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kwesi, for your moderating role. That was really great, very much appreciated. So uh, by your question, what is this clearing house, what we are clearing? Uh, let me start answering that question as uh, the, from the, the presentation of Martin, Dr. Kenda Shell was very clear what that program has achieved so far. It started three years back, as Martin said, as a concept, but now, is being operationalized on the ground with uh, very practical uh, examples, results. And uh, some of our colleagues, the fish compact leaders, the iron beans and sorghum millet uh, came up with a clear specific achievement and the others were uh, presented during the, uh, the speaker uh, from the speech from uh, Martin and, uh, and Ken. So, this whole to happen, one might say, oh, that's, this is a very complex program. Oh, but how do you operationalize it? So uh, specifically, uh, the third clearing house role is, as you can see, there is uh, a technology developer, a source of technology, and there is another side, the technology users, that is government, private sector. So the, the, the third clearing house is in the middle. Uh, uh, the third clearing house mostly is possible of vetting and profiling a technology provided by the CG centers and uh, other specialized research institution as was very well highlighted throughout uh, this session. So what clearing house does that profiling them and, and then uh, package them in the way that uh, the government, the end users are able to uh, take this technology uh, to the hands of farmers. So our role specifically, as I said, uh, and one, uh, as Ken Dashiell said, the, 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 we, we, as you see the productivity and the, 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 the resilient will not be achieved only by high yielding varieties of maize or rice, but we are considering as a bundle of technology. So by bundling all this technology together, not only uh, seed, but together with soil fertility, water uh, uh, management, but also the whole good agriculture practices that will lead to the uh, uh, productivity per se in sustainable and resilient manner. So the third clearing house play that law, profiling all these uh, technologies into the catalog bundled technologies, and then we put in the hands of government uh, and, 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 and then the users. So as most of participants say throughout and actively, and also the panelists, uh, it is very clear to achieve 
uh, this food system uh, on the continent will only happen through a strong partnership. So that's how uh, working with uh, the CG centers or other specialized uh, uh, institution, the clearing house support the government, especially with that brokerage role, especially as you look at that government developing all these uh, uh, programs the, uh, at their country level. So we bring together all these technical assistance and the support countries to formulate their programs by integrating all these proven technology that will make a difference to their uh, countries as responding to the different challenges they are facing. So that's what I can say on the clearing house as uh, responding to your question, uh, Kwesi. Otherwise, um, uh, this, uh, as has been said, uh, we are together throughout this journey. And I would sincerely would like to uh, thank my uh, colleagues who have been throughout uh, the chat box and the participants also responding also to some of the questions, but someone answered the question, we are ready and to, to take on one uh, response to some of the uh, colleagues because some of the, uh, we have their email address. So on behalf of the tax uh, management team, our sincere appreciation goes to Dr. Martin Fregene, the director at the FTB, uh, to Alfred Dixon, to Dr. Ken Dachin, the deputy director general for their very active in participation and their insight throughout. Also our very active participation and uh, contribution from our panelists, uh, especially Prof. Bernadette, uh, Dr. Tabo, and Dr. Robin, was very clear that uh, with this whole uh, achievement we can take to the continent, the concept works, proven. So it's all through this partnership uh, with uh, uh, all partners being from the development world and our thanks to the African Development Bank who supported this program and also the BMJ Foundation to take this to the scale in the hands of farmers. So we promised that uh, our start program, we are there and we have shown that for the last three years, the program is now operationalized and results are there. The next is to take to the scale. So a, through a strong partnership, we can easily uh, achieve and end hunger on this continent. So uh, together, let's join efforts. I saw we, we, we took note of all the comment you provide in the chat box. We are going to consider and as we improve our intervention on the ground and achieve the free continent without hunger. And it's possible with this uh, using uh, the food system through a resilient uh, technology uh, that has been being implemented. So once again, thank you very much and uh, for your active participation. Thank you very much, uh, Kwesi. Uh, that was great. So we thank you for your participation. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, innocent. Before we break up, uh, I want you to turn on your video. Uh, turn on your, your video screen. And um, on your screen, if you look on the top right hand corner, you will see the view button. I want you to click on that. You click on the view and you will see three options. I want you to click on the option of gallery, click on the option of gallery, and uh, yes, so please turn on your video, turn on your video, it's just 
one minute, so it shouldn't be a problem with bandwidth and we finish anyway. I see a lot of videos which are not yet on. So let's wait and see if we can have the videos to come on. Oh, that's wonderful. I've seen Lawrence Kent from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, Lawrence has been quietly in the background listening. Thank you so much, Lawrence. <laughs> it's really great. Um, oh, we're not gonna be successful because I wanted us to capture faces so we can take a group photo, a series of shots, but I don't know whether the problem is from my end. I only see very few faces. Um, is that the same way you see it at your end, Innocent? No, we can see many faces. Uh, I see. Okay, then, yeah. all right. Then in that case, I'll ask Atai. Atai, if you can, if you are also seeing the faces, uh, you would need to take the different, uh, the, the arrow on the right will take you, you know, so different channels. And we would like to capture, capture the, the photos before we, we round up. Atai, are you, are you doing that, please? Yes, yes, I'm taking. Uh, I will enjoin others to please uh, switch on their videos. I'm on the last uh, page now. Okay, excellent. So let's take what we can. And uh, I think my end, it may be internet problem because most people haven't, I can see faces. Okay, so whilst that is being done, I just want to add uh, to what Innocent has said that we are very, very happy that you have participated in this. At a point, we were about 140 uh, people in this group. Right now, we are about 100. Uh, so at least 100 people stayed to the very end. I would like to thank the African Development Bank and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who have been our principal sponsors and donors in this whole initiative. And I want to thank all of you as individuals and also your respective uh, institutions and organizations. We are looking forward to continuing to be part. Please join the UNFSS uh, process. There's a lot going on this week, which is the science days, uh, but it also is coming up with the main event itself. So with that, thank you all very much and uh, have a wonderful rest of the week. Bye for now. <laughs>